to this month's episode of the A to Z of Tudor Places, the series in which we explore some of the most fascinating historic sites in the UK, with, of course, an emphasis on their Tudor history. Hello my friends, I'm Sarah and I'm the Tudor Travel Guide, and in this episode we will be looking at a building that has been singled out in recent times as being an quote, outstanding survival of domestic architecture in England of its period. Yes, today we are talking about the glorious Penshurst Place in Kent. Now Penshurst is in fact just three miles or so away from perhaps its slightly better known Kentish cousin, Hever Castle, which is of course fated as the childhood home of Anne Boleyn. However, Penshurst also has an illustrious Tudor history and strong links to the Boleyn family. As ever, before we dive into the characters and events associated with Penshurst, let's look at a brief history of the early origins of the house. According to the well-known architectural historian, of whom I'm a great fan, Anthony Emery, the 4,000-acre manor was bought by the wealthy merchant and three-time Lord Mayor of London, Sir John Pulteney, in 1338. And the house is one of the earliest examples of the fully-fledged medieval plan which formed the basis for all major residences for the next 200 years. So it's really such an important house architecturally. Now, like Hever Castle, which we've already mentioned, it is built, or Penshurst is built, of golden coloured sandstone, which is streaked with brownish stains of iron, and that gives the building a real wonderful warmth of colouring. Now, over the centuries, there has been successive development at Penshurst, as you might imagine, but of particular interest to us are three surviving areas that would have existed at the time of Henry VIII's visits to the estate, as well as the later addition of an Elizabethan long gallery, a particularly fine long gallery, if I may say so. So let's explore some of the principal features of this most charming medieval buildings. When you visit Penshurst Place today, one of the first parts of the house that you will enter is the Great Hall via its porch and screens passage, just as people have done for centuries. Oh my goodness, and what a great hall it is. It was built by Sir John in 1341 after he was given a license to crenellate, which basically is a 19th century term to describe documents that granted any holder the permission to build fortifications. Thankfully, for time travellers like you and I, that hall at Penshurst has been little altered over time. It is enormous and it takes one's breath away. It's just one of those places that you walk into and you just go, wow, wow, wow. And to give you, therefore, an idea of the scale of the hall, well, it measures 62 feet long and 39 feet wide with an unusual chestnut roof, not oak, chestnut, which rises 58 feet from the ground. Now, according to Anthony Emery, at the time of its construction, this space had no pier in England. It was that magnificent. Now, when you visit today, you will notice that there is a minstrel's gallery above the screen's passage, and that was added in the late 16th century. However, at the service end of the hall, literally where you enter, within the screen's passage, you will notice on your right three centrally positioned doorways, linked by their hoods, which once served the buttery, the pantry and the kitchen passage, respectively. Unfortunately, the medieval kitchens, which would have laid beyond, were destroyed in the 19th century, but it is fantastic to be able to see the outlines of the doorways into each of these three different areas, as would have been usual and was the normal arrangement when halls such as the one at Penshurst was originally built. 
Now at the other end of the hall, there is the usual dais upon which the king and his most honoured guests would be seated at a large trestle table. Two of these tables remain in the hall today and unbelievably these date from the late 15th century. Wow! And so they would have borne witness indeed to the events that we are going to describe in this video. There are really unique survivors of the period, quite, quite mind-blowing. As you cross the hall beneath your feet, you'll notice red floor tiles and you will see a quite a rare surviving central octagonal hearth. Now, all of those features date from at least the 16th century and they may be earlier. But in any case, the blackened crown posts above your head are evidence of long use of the central hearth with the smoke escaping through the Louvre in the roof. <laughs> now what I love about the Hall at Pensers is that you can see all of these features that you would hope to see in a medieval Great Hall and they are still intact. I love it for that reason. At the high end of the hall you will find another beautiful feature of Penshurst. Now this was built I believe in the late 15th century and it's the Newell Stone Staircase which leads from the high end of the hall to the first floor. Now this staircase would have allowed for the Lord or the King, his family and his most honoured guests easy access from the high end of the hall where they would have been dining to the privy apartments above their head and that is where you are heading next. So once you've ascended this staircase the first room you enter is a withdrawing chamber or a solar, it's given different names. Now, this chamber was built in the mid 14th century but it was heavily altered around 500 years later. But initially with the original house this is where the medieval building would have ended. Just a large living chamber which was lit on three sides by fine windows. Now if you look carefully you'll notice that several of these windows have been blocked up today as later additions were made to the building, leaving the room as we see it now. But the use of this room was the place for the Lord and his family to withdraw from public life and of course that's something which became increasingly fashionable in the 16th century. The two rooms that you follow on the tour of Penshurst today are called the Queen Elizabeth Room and subsequently the Tapestry Room. These were built in the mid 14th century by the then owner, the Duke of Bedford. It's likely that back in the 16th century this range could have just contained one big reception room but Anthony Emery postulates it was more likely two rooms, probably, quote, of equal size and of increasing privacy, unquote, with an end passage or closet to finish the sequence of the rooms. Since these rooms comprise the principal private apartments of the Lord or King when he visited, we are safe to imagine the likes of Henry VIII and the Boleyns entertaining, dining and relaxing in these rooms during the sojourns to Penshurst. Now, we will come to talk about that a little bit more in a moment. However, before we get there, it's worth mentioning that as the tour continues today, you will then leave that sequence of rooms and enter a fine longer gallery which was built during the Elizabethan period. And this is ornately decorated with a rich plaster ceiling and the walls with Jacobean woodwork. Many, many recognisable Tudor faces can be seen in the portraiture hanging on the walls. And if the long gallery is familiar to you, well, that's probably because you've seen it forming the backdrop to various well-known films and TV series, including the likes of Wolf Hall. Okay, so having done a little bit about the structure and the appearance of the house, we're going to leave the tour there. 
and instead we're going to focus on some of the characters and the Tudor history that is associated with Penshurst Place. Right, so moving on. As we've already heard, although Penshurst history reaches way back into the medieval period, there are at least three significant events from Tudor history that occurred at Pen Penshurst that we can be interested in. The first of these is in association with the Boleyn family and the death of a little infant Boleyn, Thomas. The second is the news of the appointment of Charles V of Holy Roman Emperor, which reached Henry VIII's ears while he was staying at Penshurst, and he wasn't too happy about it, I can tell you that. And finally, we have the myth and the legend that swirls around Penshurst and its association of Henry VIII and his pursuit of Anne Boleyn. So, let's explore these together now. Well, firstly, let's talk about the Boleyns and how they became associated with Penshurst. To understand that, we need to roll back time to the early 15th. 20s when the Boleyns were undoubtedly in the ascendant. It was around this time that Mary Boleyn commenced, commenced her relationship with Henry VIII. Many historians date this to circa 1522, although I should say there is absolutely no definitive proof of that. However, what we do know is that as a result of this relationship, which lasted several years, Thomas Boleyn was rewarded with an increasing number of grants and titles. One such grant given in that very same year was the stewardship of Penshurst Place. Penshurst, being a substantial country house, which had recently been forfeit to the Crown following the execution of its prior owner, the Duke of Buckingham, in 1521. So what about this role of steward? What did that mean? Well, it meant that Sir Thomas had the responsibility for the upkeep of Penshurst and its park on behalf of the Crown. And in return, you could benefit, or Thomas could benefit, from the revenue that came from the estate. Sounds good to me. Now, being only a few miles from Hever, which of course was the Boleyn's principal home, Sir Thomas and possibly his family undoubtedly visited from time to time. Perhaps initially they were there as guests of their neighbour, the Duke of Buckingham, or after the Duke's execution, of course, in role of steward to oversee the running of the house. Now there's some evidence that actually this might well have been the case in the nearby church. If you go and explore there, as I encourage you to do, you will find a small brass plaque affixed to the floor in the Sydney Chapel. And there is an inscription marking the burial site of Thomas Boleyn, son of Sir Thomas Boleyn. Now, there is a great deal of controversy about the age of Thomas when he died. The presence of his tomb does seem to suggest, though, that regardless of the circumstance, the Boleyn family were in residence at Penshurst when tragedy struck. Now, belonging to the crown, it's also quite feasible that, as legend suggests, Henry VIII once used Penshurst on at least one occasion as his residence while in pursuit of Anne Boleyn. Unfortunately, there's no documented evidence of this, although there is one recorded visit made by the King and Court to Penshurst in August 1519. Now, at this time, the King was the guest of the aforementioned Duke of Buckingham. He obviously still had his head at this point. Oh, a little bit of history about Buckingham. Through his Yorkist blood, he was close to the throne and indeed boastful of it. In fact, he was known at the time as Proud Buckingham. In an absolutely outrageous and ostentatious display of his wealth and status, the Duke lavished £2,500, which 
equates to somewhere in the region of £1.5 million pounds in today's money on entertainment for the King during that visit alone. But it was while Henry was at Penshurst that he received news via a chap called Richard Pace that Charles of Castile had been elected as the new Holy Roman Emperor Charles V. In fact, it is reported in the letters and papers of Henry VIII that the king was playing with the French hostages when the news arrived. Apparently, Henry carried his disappointment, well, because he was disappointed. And according to historian Alison Weir, he invited, rather kindly, Richard Pace to stay for supper. The next day, with the visit over, the king moved on to Otford Palace, which of course was the focus of last month's A to Z, and you can check that out by following the link above. However, back to our story. We should remember that neither Sir Thomas nor Anne was present at that event because both of them were in France at the time. Thomas was the English ambassador to the French court and Anne was still a maid of honour to the French Queen and yet to fall upon the gaze of this most capricious of monarchs. Well, there you have it. A brief history of Pensers rolled into some of the key events and characters from the Tudor era who are associated with this most wonderful and magnificent of locations. And if you want to see me talk about some of these on location at Penshurst, you can follow the link above, which will take you to another video that I made at Penshurst a couple of years ago. But if you want to visit Penshurst for yourself, well, the good news is, is that it is in a beautiful part of the country, Kent, which is often known as the Garden of England, and for good reason. It is one of my favourite parts of England to visit. It's very quaint with lots of narrow winding country roads and some to die for properties that you will catch a glimpse of as you meander through the county once you get off the main roads. Now eventually you'll arrive at Penshurst village itself and I'm glad to say it has a lovely pub so you can grab yourself a substantial meal. But note that there is a cafe on site at Penshurst called the Porcupine Cafe and that of course gives a nod and a wink to the emblem of the current owners, the Sydney family, <laughs> who have in fact been in possession of Penshurst since it was gifted to the family during the reign of King Edward VI in the 1550s. So that is a beautiful little cafe in and of itself and it makes for a great place to have afternoon tea or a light lunch and very conveniently it's situated right next to the castle, the visitor centre and the ample on-site parking. I have stopped by there many of a time and I can highly recommend it. Well, I hope you get to visit Penshurst Place if you haven't yet or that you are now planning a return visit with all this new and lovely Tudor information at your fingertips. It's been a pleasure to be your guide today and I hope you've enjoyed this episode of the Tudor Travel Guides A to Z of Tudor Places. And I, of course, will be returning next month when I'm going to tackle the letter Q. So wait to see where we visit next month and I will look forward to seeing you there. But until then, my friends, thank you for joining me today and it's happy time travelling. Mm -hmm.